we begin our worship service with prayer. O Lord God, our Heavenly Father, by the blessed light of your divine word, you have led us to the knowledge of your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask that you would renew us with the grace of your Holy Spirit, that we might always walk in the light of your truth and rejoicing with sure confidence in Christ as our Savior, may in the end be brought unto everlasting salvation. It is in the name of Jesus that we ask this. Amen.
This morning we'll be following the order of service on page 12 and following the front of the worship supplement or the brown hymnal in front of you. This Sunday is Pentecost Sunday. Lutherans don't often focus on the work of God the Holy Spirit, or at least that's the accusation that's often made. And yet on this Sunday we are reminded of the importance of the work of God the Holy Spirit. While it is through the work of Jesus who died on the cross and has paid the debt of our sin, if it weren't for the working of the Holy Spirit who brings us to faith, trusting in the work of Jesus for us, we wouldn't receive the benefits that Christ has won for the entire world. And so on this Sunday, we are reminded of the importance of faith, which is worked by God the Holy Spirit in each one of us. We begin our worship this morning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and to serve Him as His dear children. But we have disobeyed Him and deserved only His wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to Him and plead for His mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven you all of your sins. By the perfect life and the innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May the Lord give us strength to live according to his will. We pray, O Lord God, you have enlightened the hearts of your people by sending them your Holy Spirit. Grant us by that same Holy Spirit to grow in faith and knowledge of our Lord Jesus and evermore to rejoice in his holy comfort through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, ever one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Each one of our scripture readings for today highlights the work of God, the Holy Spirit. It is important for us to realize that one of the reasons that 
Lutherans don't emphasize the Holy Spirit as much as, for example, the Pentecostals, uh, the holiness churches of our world, is because the role of the Holy Spirit isn't to highlight himself, but rather to point us to Jesus, to direct us to the cross of Jesus and through the word, silently to work behind the scenes to bring us to not only know Jesus, but to believe in him. In our Old Testament reading from Ezekiel chapter 36, we see the working of God, the Holy Spirit, not just in the New Testament church, but also in the days of the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit was at work in the Old Testament in the same way that he is today, and that is through the message of the gospel, to hallow our lives through sanctification, which is the technical word that's used for the work of God, the Holy Spirit, to make us holy through faith in Jesus, and then to cause us to live holy lives that then glorify our God. We read from Ezekiel 36, beginning with verse 22. Therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, I do not do this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the nations wherever you went. And I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. And the nations shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God, when I am hallowed in you before their eyes. For I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all countries, and bring you into your own land. And then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. Then you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. You shall be my people and I will be your God. One of the most amazing things when we consider the work of God, the Holy Spirit, is the amazing nature of the work that the Holy Spirit does. When we look at verses like this and how Israel is described in the Old Testament, how they profaned the name of God, how they desecrated him through their false worship of idols, we're reminded that we aren't any better. We fall into the very same sins and traps that the people of the Old Testament did. We are all sinful, but God desires the salvation of sinful human beings. And he accomplishes that great miracle in the Old Testament as well as among us today through the power and the working of his Holy Spirit. In our New Testament reading from Acts chapter 2, we have the account of Pentecost, where God the Holy Spirit again worked in order to bring faith into the hearts of those that were gathered in Jerusalem on the festival of Pentecost. We read this account in Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven, and when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, 
whatever could this mean? Others, mocking, said, they are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and treasure it. morning to make confession of our faith in not only the work that Jesus has accomplished for us through his death and resurrection, but also the working of the Holy Spirit who brings us to know and to believe in Jesus' work for salvation. We'll be using this morning the words of the Apostles' Creed. This can be found on page 15 in the front of your worship supplement. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. We'll continue with the singing of hymn 234. This hymn does come from the Pentecost section in our hymnal. And we'll emphasize the work and the role of the Holy Spirit in bringing us to faith. In 234.
Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. <coughs> Over the last couple of weeks, I've had some fellow pastors ask me, well, do you have your, your farewell sermon text picked out? Well, I said, it's a little bit more complicated than that. It's a baccalaureate service. And we have new members that are going to be received into membership on that Sunday. So there's a lot of things that are going on on that particular Sunday. I've never been one to be a free text pastor where you just say, I'm going to choose a text, the one that seems to fit for this particular situation and preach on it. And as I took a look at the three readings for Pentecost, and I've noticed this over and over again in my years in the ministry, that if I would have tried to pick a text out of somewhere in the 66 books of the Bible, I don't think I could have found one that fit better for a baccalaureate, a reception of new membership, and a farewell address. And it's found in the words of the gospel for this Pentecost Sunday. It's found recorded in John chapter 6, what is known as part of Jesus' bread of life sermon. We read these verses found in your bulletin. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can understand it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, Does this offend you? What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. And he said, therefore I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my Father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Then Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered them, did I not choose you, the twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was he who would betray him, being one of the twelve. Thus far, our text. Let me give you a little bit of background for our text for this morning. This is found early on in the Gospel of John in John chapter 6. And it takes place about halfway through Jesus' ministry. He had a three-year ministry. We're about a year and a half into those three years. And at this point in the ministry of Jesus, he was popular. He was the in thing. Everybody wanted to follow Jesus. And then, as we see Jesus preaching and teaching, healing all kinds of people. Crowds were following after Jesus. Everybody wanted to be around him. Thousands of people, and we're talking literally thousands of people, would gather on the seaside, right up on the hills above the, above the Sea of Galilee to listen to the preaching of Jesus, bringing their sick to him, hoping that, they would, that he would heal them. And it was on one of those events, as the huge crowd of possibly 10,000 people gathered around him on the northern shores of the Sea of Galilee, that he told his disciples to feed the large crowd of people that were gathered there. 
It was a test for his disciples. And they said, we don't have enough food to feed all of these people. And so Jesus says, well, gather up what you do have. And after gathering up a few loaves of bread and a few fish, Jesus tells everybody to sit down and he breaks the food into small portions and the disciples distribute it. We're told that over 5,000 men, as well as women and children, ate from this small portion of food that Jesus had and they were satisfied, they were filled. And this just caused Jesus' popularity to raise another notch. They wanted to make Jesus their king. Imagine, a king who could feed them. They would never have to work another day in their life. They wanted to take Jesus by force and make him their king. They didn't care whether he wanted to be their king or not. They were going to make him do it. There was nothing better than this. And so we're told that Jesus made his way up into the mountains and then crossed into the storm of the Sea of Galilee where he calms the storm where the disciples are. And he makes it to the shore of the Sea of Galilee. Those thousands of people that were gathered there, they journeyed around seeing that Jesus had gotten, that he hadn't gotten into the boat, but found him on the other side and said, how did you get here? And that's what prompts the verses of John chapter 6. Jesus says, you, you followed me, not because you saw the signs or that you enjoyed my preaching, but because you ate the loaves and were full. And so he preaches this sermon that emphasizes what his goal truly was, who he really was, that he wasn't just a miracle worker, that he hadn't come to become an earthly king, to establish an earthly kingdom and to feed our stomachs. He came for an altogether higher purpose. And so he tells them, in contrast to eating the loaves and the fish to fill their physical stomach. That if they really wanted to follow him, if they really wanted what he came to offer them, they had to eat his flesh and drink his blood in order to have eternal life. Now, some people think that Jesus was referring to the Lord's Supper. It sounds a lot like the Lord's Supper, but that's not what Jesus was speaking about. What he was saying is that you need to take me in to yourselves you need to eat my word to digest it and for the Holy Spirit to work that into faith inside each one of you. He says without faith, without the working of the Holy Spirit, it doesn't matter how often we eat the loaves and the fish. What's truly important is that we understand who Jesus is and that we believe in the salvation that he alone is able to bring. The disciples... And I mean that in the broadest sense. Those people that were followers of Jesus, they were at a crossroads. What were they going to do? Were they going to continue to follow Jesus? Or was it too tough? Was it too difficult? Did the things that he had, had to say as now the teachings of Jesus started to notch up and become more specific and more difficult, were they going to continue to follow the one who they had followed and wanted to follow in the past. There's a similarity today. Our graduates are at a crossroads. It's a change in their lives. They're going from high school onto a different stage in life. Tim and Kathy, you're at a crossroads. It's a different path. There's different paths that the Lord has placed in front of us and that the world offers before us. And the question is, which path are you going to follow? And the same thing is true for the members of Grace, for the Mayhew family. We're all at a crossroads. The question is, and Jesus gives us three questions to ask as we face these crossroads. Where are you going from here? Jesus poses three questions to these followers of him. The first one is found in verse 61 of our text. We're told that Jesus had preached this bread of life sermon and he had said, you need to eat my flesh and drink my blood. You need to take me in by faith. You need to accept who I am, that I am the one who has come down from heaven and I am the one who has come here not to be an earthly king, but to establish a heavenly kingdom 
forgiveness of sins, salvation and deliverance from the devil. That is my goal. That is the purpose for which I have come. And that means taking up your cross and following me. But we're told that the disciples, broad sense, were troubled. Look at again the text, the opening verses of our text. Therefore, many of his disciples, again, think more than the 12. These are people that say, hey, we're a follower of Jesus. We're one of his disciples. Many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a hard saying. Who can understand it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, does this offend you? Hard sayings. Fifty years ago, the first pastor of Grace Evangelical Lutheran Church wrote a series of articles on hard sayings. Issues like the role of women in the church, close communion, fellowship. Those were hard sayings 50 years ago. They're still hard sayings today. But over the course of 50 years, there are many new hard sayings that the Christian church has faced. Things that weren't issues 50 years ago have become very serious issues for the church today. And God's word hasn't changed, but our society has. Many of those hard sayings of the scripture today deal with the family, the role of husband and wife, the role of marriage, divorce, male and female. These are serious issues in our society today that the world, they reject what it is that God says in his word. If P.F. Nolting were here today and wrote another hard sayings, it would deal with those types of issues. Jesus is asking his disciples, his, these people that were following him, the church of the first century, does this offend you? It's not about what our society says. It's not about what other Christian churches teach. It's not even about what the CLC teaches. Later on, when Tim and Kathy come forward, I want you to pay attention to the promise that they make. Same promise that we've heard before that each one of us have made, and that is not to be faithful to Grace Evangelical Lutheran Church, not to be faithful to the Church of the Lutheran Confession, but to be faithful to the truth of God's Word, wherever that might be. Does this Offend you, Jesus asks. When we consider the hard sayings of Scripture that apply to the modern world today, they are challenging. And our society rejects them. Many Christian churches reject them. The day may even come when grace or the CLC rejects them. Lord forbid. But if and when that day comes, the Lord calls us to follow him to be faithful to his word does this offend you the answer to that question is it shouldn't because it's the truth of God's word it should not offend us it should be the very foundation of our lives when many of the disciples heard this statement of Jesus were told that they did depart we're told in verse 66 of our text, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Those hard sayings did cause many people not to follow Jesus. They couldn't accept the hard sayings that Jesus was presenting. And yet they were the ones who lost out. And so now after these disciples have left, these people who really weren't disciples, but wanted to be, at least in a sense, Jesus now turns to his 12. He asks them question number two. He says, do you also want to go away? As we look at Christianity today, we see that there are many people just like the disciples in the broad sense in our text from John chapter six. 
that are unwilling, unable to accept the hard sayings of Jesus. And instead, they're going to go their own direction. They're going to go their own way. Jesus says to the twelve, do you also want to go away? For our graduates, four or five years ago, you stood before the church and you confirmed your Christian faith. You stood before this congregation of believers and you said, I accept the teachings of God's word. I believe that in this church, the teachings of God's word are proclaimed. And you made a promise to be faithful in your use of the word of God and in the sacraments. Each one of you have made a similar promise. At one point in our lives, we too promised knowing that God's word was proclaimed to be faithful to that word in our use of his word and sacraments, the very means, the very tools which the Holy Spirit uses not only to bring us to faith, but to keep us in that faith. How have we done in keeping those promises? Well, we all fail, don't we? We face the challenges in the world around us, the temptations in the world around us. We struggle with those things. But we need to remember what it is that Jesus tells us right in the heart of our text, the connection to Pentecost. In verse 63, he says, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The Lord reminds us that we have no strength in and of ourselves to carry out the work that he desires for us. He alone is able to do that. And he does that through his spirit through his word and sacrament. When we remove ourselves from his word and sacrament, that faith which he created, whether it be at baptism or through confirmation, it starts to shrivel and die. He wants us to be connected to his word, that we might grow in our faith, grow in grace in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus said, do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life. Jesus asks us this question. We who are his disciples today, do you also want to go away? Again, the answer is, you shouldn't because Jesus has the words of eternal life. Peter tells us in our text, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life and we have come to believe and to know that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Where else will you go? Where else can you find what it is that God offers to you, promises to you through his word and sacraments? There is nowhere else to go. Finally, the Lord asks a third question at the end of our text. In verse 70, Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve, and one of you is a devil? Pentecost is a reminder that God desires the salvation of all people. Jew, Gentile, male, female, adult, child. God desires the salvation of every single sinner. And we can't do that of our own. We're powerless. No one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. He is the one who has brought us to faith. He chose you and me. He washed us clean through baptism when we were children or maybe adults. He's washed our sins away, which he earned through his death on the cross. He offers to continue to feed us through his word and through the sacrament of the Lord's Supper in which he nourishes that faith which he has begun in us. <coughs> Did I not choose you? This is an important reminder for us. He chose us. He desires our salvation. He gives us everything that is necessary. Everything that is needed in order to carry that work out. He's done it all for us. The only thing we can do is walk away and say we aren't interested in what it is that you give to us. It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. How important are those truths to us? The reminder that, yes, we face crossroads throughout our lives. Where do we go when we face those crossroads? Well, we know where the Lord wants us to go. He wants us to follow Him. He wants us to hear His Word, to be built up and strengthened by His sacrament. 
that we might continue to walk in his ways throughout this life. Did I not choose you, he asks. And the answer is, he did. He did choose you as his very own. And so the Lord reminds us that we should take comfort in that truth. To be assured of the Lord's promises which are new to us every morning and which are true to us and given to us through his word. It doesn't matter who's in this pulpit. What matters is what's being proclaimed from the pulpit. That it's coming from God's word. And when his word is proclaimed and his sacraments are administered according to his word, there the Lord is working. The one who has chosen us to keep us in that one true Christian faith unto life everlasting. Jesus asks our graduates. He asks Tim and Kathy. He asks each one of us three important questions in the crossroads of life. Do we find this offensive? Do we also want to go away? Do we remember that God has chosen us to be his very own? Take comfort in the crossroads of this life, knowing that it is God who works through his word for our good now and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Please rise. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. be seated. We'll sing hymn 400 as we think about our graduates, as we think about our new members, as we think about ourselves in the crossroads of this life. This hymn is a favorite of many of the members of this congregation. Uh, there's a couple of women who choose this just about every time they have the opportunity to in their ladies' meetings. But it's a reminder of the gifts that the Lord has given to us, and how we have the privilege of using our hands and our voices, our hearts, in the service of our Lord as a result of the work of God the Holy Spirit in us. We sing him 400.
This morning we have the privilege once again to receive new members into the congregation here at Grace. Over the past, well, Tim, you and I have met for quite a long time, uh, but Kathy also has joined us. Now, Tim actually went through instruction twice. He couldn't get it up. Um, we went through instruction once, and then he went through it back again uh, when he met Kathy. And so they are, they've studied God's Word. They've come to the conclusion that God's Word is taught here at Grace and are eager to become members here of this congregation, congregation along with you. Would you two please come forward? As I mentioned earlier, we've had the privilege of hearing these questions recently with confirmation, as well as with the, the membership of the Allens. And these are, again, things for us to remember. These are the same promises that we have made and the same assertions that we've made trusting these things are true. Tim and Kathy, in the presence of this congregation, I ask you, do you believe that the canonical books of the Old and the New Testament are verbally inspired by God, that they are completely without error and the only source of true doctrine and instruction in the way of salvation? If so, declare so by saying, I do. Do you also acknowledge and confess that the teachings of this church are in accord with the word of God? If so, declare so by saying, I do. Do you then desire to be received by us into the fellowship of the Church of the Lutheran Confession and of Grace Evangelical Lutheran Church? If so, declare so by saying, I do. Finally, do you also intend to continue in these teachings of Scripture, which you have learned, to make diligent use of them through the means of grace, and to lead a sincere, righteous, and godly life, even unto the end? If so, declare so by saying, I do so intend with the help of God. Upon your promise, uh, by in, in the set of this congregation, invite you and welcome you to Grace El Evangelical Lutheran Church and to receive the blessings that he gives to you through his word as well as his sacrament. May the Lord continue to bless you and keep you in that word and in his faith which he has established in you. Tim and Kathy have become convinced that the doctrines, the teachings of this congregation are in accord with the Word of God, and they have declared that conviction before you. May that grace of God, through His Word, which has led them to that conviction, and each one of us to that conviction, continue to bless them in their continuing journey as children of God. Since it is God alone who is able to do those things that we are incapable of doing, in addition to our general prayer for today, we'll bring prayers on behalf of Tim and Kathy and their Christian walk with us. Please rise for prayer. <laughs> Almighty, eternal, and heavenly Father, you have poured out your spirit upon your church that he might abide with us forever, preserving us in true faith through your holy word. Grant unto us as we now call upon your name everything that we need for our spiritual life and salvation. We thank you that by your spirit you have called sinners like us to faith in Jesus, giving us power to not only believe your word and gathering us into the fellowship of your church, but also through the power of your Holy Spirit to know more deeply and truly the scriptures that we might grow daily in grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus. Empower us to resist the temptations of our enemy, the devil, and instead give us the strength to follow the things that make for righteousness, faith, love, and peace. Pour out your spirit upon us that we may love our Savior with all our hearts and minds and keep his word with a good conscience. O oh Lord, we pray that you would stir up your church and give us zeal to seek the lost, to bind up the brokenhearted, to bring comfort to those who are afflicted, and to cheer those who mourn. May your spirit ever live in all of our homes. Lead all of our children in paths of love and obedience. Give to every parent an understanding heart and gentle ways so that together each family may be preserved in your true word and ways. 
To those among us who live alone, grant honor, integrity, the comfort of your abiding presence, and the loving fellowship of friends and family of faith. O Lord, we ask that you would govern the nations of the earth and help them to acknowledge your power and your rule over all, that they might turn from the evil ways of men and live. Give unto the authorities of our own country wisdom and insight to govern the people of our nation with honor and with justice. Almighty God, the giver and perfecter of our faith, we thank you and praise you for that message of the gospel which you have given for our instruction and edification. We ask that you would continue to bless Tim and Kathy as they continue in the knowledge of your word. By your Holy Spirit, increase their saving knowledge of you. Strengthen them daily in the divine truth of forgiveness through Jesus Christ. And keep them steadfast in your grace. Give them, as well as each one of us, the strength to fight the good fight of faith and through faith to overcome the temptations that, are bes that beset us, that we might, in the end, finally gain the crown of everlasting life. To all those who are suffering in trials or temptations, we ask that you would impart the power of your Holy Spirit and the comforting promises of your word. For those who are sick, who are weary or needy or lonely, give the peace of Christ. Let their prayers rise to you and grant them everything that they need according to your mercy and your will. All of these things we ask in the name of Jesus, who has also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Receive with believing hearts the blessing of our triune God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated. We'll close with the singing of the final hymn, hymn 338. This is a confirmation hymn, certainly appropriate last week with our two confirmation students, as well as for Tim and Kathy. But Remember that this is a prayer for each one of us as we continue in that journey of life, trusting in the Lord's work through his word in our lives. We sing hymn 338.